Okay, welcome to video number six of Diaries of a Coronavirologist. I've had a couple of days off, uh, but finally found some time to get some videos going again. Today is the 24th of March, and we're now up to a little bit under 418,000 cases, and a little bit over 18,000 deaths. So since my last video on Friday, we've gone from under 300,000 cases and around 11,000 deaths to where we're at now. So this is just a good example of how rapidly this pandemic is still spreading and why social distancing measures are being enforced around the world and quarantine and all those kind of things. We really do need to bring this under control. So my last two videos were talking about drug screens, of uh, finding drugs, so looking at remdesivir and the idea of drug repurposing. And I'm hoping that within the next day or two, there'll be some data out of our lab on the kind of repurposing work we've been doing. So stay tuned for that because I'll link it in future videos when it's out there and available for people to look at should they be interested. So as I say, my last two videos, they were kind of a back-to-back -back piece looking at drugs. And I kind of want to do something similar with my next few videos. So today I want to do a little look back at the origin of this outbreak how we got to this stage. Then I want to kind of have a little look forward, uh, talk about the potential of seasonality. So there's some suggestions that maybe we'll see fewer cases as temperatures increase, and I want to talk about that issue. And then the third of the three piece I'm planning to do is gonna be talking more about the present and talk about the COVID, uh, talk about COVID-19 and how SARS-2 is actually causing this disease. But for today, I want to take a step back and look at how we got to this stage and go all the way back to December 2019. So in December 2019, cases were, or the first reports of a new pneumonia were coming out of China. So people were developing pneumonia of unknown cause. The WHO were informed of this by Chinese authority on the 31st of December. And by the 3rd of January, there were 44 confirmed cases. So it started slow. This whole exponential growth thing, it takes a bit of time before it gets going. By the 7th of January, a novel coronavirus had been found in patients that were suffering from this pneumonia. So this was the first appearance of the SARS-2 coronavirus that was originally called novel coronavirus 2019. So in those early stages, I had some conversations I now look back on and realise that my early predictions were pretty terrible. That week that the novel coronavirus was identified, I remember a conversation in the lab with my boss where we basically said, people will probably jump, jump on this. Let's not, let's not rush to it. It's probably not going to be anything major. Followed by a conversation at the weekend while out on a walk in Baltimore where I was talking about the SARS-1 outbreak, talking about the history of the SARS outbreak and ended by saying, there's now a new coronavirus in China, but it's probably gonna be nothing big. Those comments obviously didn't age very well. So once this coronavirus was identified, we did all start to pay a bit more attention and started to follow the cases. And very early on, good information was coming out of China, uh, looking at the genome sequence of this virus. So we very rapidly learned that it was closely related to the original SARS virus. So the two of them are approximately 80% identical. The closest ancestor though of the SARS-2 coronavirus is a virus that's been identified in bats back in 2013, which is called RATG13 2013 for when it was identified. So that virus is about 96% identical to the SARS-2 coronavirus suggesting that there is common ancestry between the two. Not necessarily that SARS-2 emerged from RATG13, but that there's a common ancestor. So in the same way that humans and chimpanzees have common ancestors in our evolutionary timeline, viruses have the same thing. And if you go further back, there's probably common ancestry between SARS-1 and SARS-2. So this origin in bats seems to be fairly common for coronaviruses both of SARS coronavirus 1, the original back 2003, 2002, 2003, and MERS coronavirus from 2012, they both seem to have originated in bats as well. However, both of those had a 
an intermediate host that allowed for transmission into the human population. So for SARS-1, that was palm civets, and for MERS, that was camels. So the virus from bats went into these other hosts, replicated there, and then that's how it spread into the human population from those intermediates. We don't yet know what the true intermediate host, or if there is an intermediate host for SARS-2 is. But the origin in bats seems the most likely scenario. So there's two scenarios for then how the virus came into the human population. Either it came directly from a bat or through an intermediate host that just so happened to come into contact with a human and the virus had everything it needed to start this outbreak and start spreading in humans. Alternatively, there were minor spillover events where the virus transmitted from an animal source into a human, never really took off, but replicated a little bit, started to evolve, maybe went back to a bat to infect that bat, or just had more and more contact with humans over a slow period, which allowed it to develop the ability to spread into humans. And we don't know which of these scenarios is more likely. Various sampling of bats has found that there are coronaviruses in bats that can infect human cells in the lab without any further adaptation. So potentially, just coming into contact with a human may be enough. Or, as I say, the alternative is that there were these multiple spillover events, and it's going to be interesting in future to look back at banked samples from hospitals to see whether there was any evidence of this coronavirus before we think it really hit off in the human population, which is probably around November, December time of 20, uh, 2019. So one final thing to tackle about the origin of this virus is it is not a deliberate release of a virus from a lab. It's not humanly engineered. So it, it really looks like this was natural selection. Mother Nature can do this a lot better than humans can do it. So the reason for thinking this and for saying it and why this kind of the gen why it is the general consensus is based on the receptor binding of this virus. So all viruses need to bind to a cellular receptor. This allows it to attach to the cell and it allows it to go into and infect that cell. The SARS-2 virus uses the same receptor as the SARS-1 uh, virus does, which is a protein called ACE2, which is angiotensin converting, converting enzyme 2. And I'll come back to that when I talk about the COVID-19 disease, I'm sure. So there's a small segment of the virus that binds to the receptor, which is called the receptor binding domain, the RBD. And there's six amino acids that are very important for the interaction of the SARS named viruses that regulate the receptor binding domain. So we know obviously that the SARS-1 binding domain can attach very well to ACE2 and it can use that to infect cells. The SARS-2 virus has five amino acids different in that six amino acid stretch. So this is quite a big variation. And computational modeling to look at whether though that combination of amino acids would bind well to ACE2 suggests that it wouldn't. And yet in the lab we find that SARS-2 binds very well to ACE2. So no one would have predicted that, suggesting humans probably didn't design this. And moreover, to actually come to that realisation, a huge, crazy amount of combinations, there's the word, combinations of amino acids would have had to be tested. There's 21 amino acids, and we're talking about six stretches. So assuming I've got it right, I've got it the correct way around in my head, that have have to be 6 to the power of 21 different combinations to be tested to find this specific stretch of amino acids that seem to allow this virus to bind well to ACE2. It might be 21 to the 6th, it's been a long day, I apologise, maybe someone can point out in the comments which way round that is, sorry for my brain not being fully functional at the minute. So that probability alone and the lack of computational modelling really suggests that this virus wasn't humanly engineered. And moreover, the rest of the genome is 
too dissimilar to the other coronaviruses that spread in humans. If it was going to be engineered, it would have shown more signatures of a backbone of a different coronavirus. The more likely scenario for how this receptor binding domain of SARS-2 emerged in this virus through natural selection in the wild is that there are SARS-like viruses in pangolins which have this receptor binding domain. So potentially there was some kind of genetic recombination, mutation, swapping of genetic material between different viruses that allowed the virus that became SARS-2 to have this specific binding site that allows it to interact with ACE2. So it really does look like this virus came out through natural selection. As I said, we don't necessarily know whether there were multiple spillover events and there was one person who got infected and died and we never really worked out it was a virus and then maybe another one, maybe another one before it started to spread or whether it was that there was just a virus ready to go in a bat or an intermediate host and when it had the chance to come into contact with humans, that's how this all got going. For now, that's kind of academic though, because it has got going. We are now at a stage of over 400,000 cases and over 18,000 deaths and multiple countries in the world are enacting these stringent social distancing and quarantine measures. But because I want to do a little three part piece, I thought I'd do, let's have a little look back at the outbreak, how it started before we move forward and look at what could be coming in future, thinking about seasonality. But that's for tomorrow. It's been another long day, it's 10.30. I've not had dinner yet, so again. So I'm gonna have to call it a night and thank everyone for watching. Please continue to comment. Please subscribe if you're finding these videos useful. As I've said before, I can't always comment, I can't always promise that they'll come out super regularly, but I'll try to put them out as best I can. So subscribing will hopefully allow people to stay up to date with it. So thanks for tuning in. As I said in my previous video, please stay safe, wash your hands, stop panic buying toilet paper and keep calm and carry on. Things are crazy, but we are going to get through this. Thanks.